Hey, it's Nick here with Grayscale Gorilla. And in today's tutorial, you're gonna learn how to set up a shallow depth of field scene using Cinema 4D and Redshift. You're gonna learn how to set up beautiful out of focus areas and learn how to control it for the perfect look. And don't forget, if you're looking to learn even more about Redshift, we have some amazing free training over at grayscalegorilla.com slash redshift. Just sign up for a free Grayscale Gorilla account and get instant access to over 16 hours of Redshift training today. All right, with that, let's Let's get started. All right, here we are in Cinema 4D and let's get started. The first thing we need to do is set up a ton of little details so that when we set up our camera in the depth of field, it catches all of the nice little details. So let's get started with a spline. Let's go up to the spline menu and pick the helix. Now, this is my favorite way to make a straight spline. There's probably a ton of other ways, but I just grab a helix and I set my start radius to zero, my end radius to zero, and then you have control over the height and you have a straight uh, spline. Now I want this to aim up in the air, so I'm gonna click this until it aims up. I always forget which one. XZ, it looks like the right one. Now we have a spline aiming up. Next, let's clone this spline. I'm gonna hit Shift C on my keyboard and search for clone. And uh, I'm gonna grab the cloner. You can either double click it here or just hit enter. And I'm gonna drag the helix into the clone and we're gonna set up a bunch of these splines here. So let's go to our cloner. Let's go to object and let's do seven by seven. And we need this to be much closer. It's a good time to start talking about scale. To make things look small and have that really micro macro depth of field look, you want your scene to also be small. It will help when we set up our camera. So uh, instead of these spaced apart 200 centimeters, I'm gonna space them apart four centimeters. And now we have this tight little cluster of splines and I don't need it to be this tall. So I'm gonna grab the height and shrink it down. Okay, so what do we do now? Well, now I want to clone spheres on each of these sp splines here. So let's go grab a sphere and man, oh man, is that big. Let's make a teeny one. Let's go 0.7. That's a little baby sphere. And we're gonna add another cloner here and we're going to clone the sphere. So put the sphere in the cloner. And in your new cloner, let's call this sphere cloner. In your new cloner, come down here, instead of uh, cloning on a grid, you want to clone on an object. And we're gonna clone directly in this new uh, set of splines here. So right here under object, come down to cloner and just drag it in. And now you see that we're cloning spheres directly on these splines. And uh, what it's doing right now, if we look at the settings is counting to 10 on each spline, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And you could turn this up or down if you wanna add more um, spheres to, to this uh, uh, object here. Um, but the next thing we wanna do is make this less uh, of a grid. So what can we do? Well, let's uh, grab our sphere cloner and let, let's hit Shift-C and type in uh, random. There we go. I'm gonna hit Enter, and if you have that sphere cloner selected, a random effector will automatically be added, and we get random movement here. We don't want this random movement all over the place, so let's go into our parameter, and let's turn this uh, down. I think all we want is Z. That is correct, okay. So Z, randomizing the Z position will move it up and down the spline and give us this more like uh, random look that we're going for so that we have these little dots all over the place. Now is a good time to add a little bit of extra geometry to this sphere. And while we're in our cloner, let's also set this to multi-instance. This will allow us to add a ton of spheres without um, slowing down our viewport as much. Okay, so what do we do now when we have these spheres that are touching? Well, here is where we're gonna add a push apart effector. So grab your sphere cloner, hit shift C, and let's type in push. And push part is selected right there. I'm gonna hit enter on my keyboard and boom, all the spheres are gone. Well, what happened? Well, the push part effector says, hey, if any sphere is within 100 centimeters of another one, move it away until it's at least 100 centimeters apart. So if we start moving out, you're gonna see all these spheres are here, they're just randomly scattered, you know, way, way away from where we want them. Uh, way, way away, okay. All right, anyway, let's take this radius and set it to one. And let's move in and realize that what it's doing now is moving 
uh, some of these spheres. We don't want them to move. We actually want them to scale. So go into this push part menu and click on scale apart. And now you're gonna see some of these spheres are being scaled down so that they are not touching. That's a good example right there. Okay, uh, what else can we do? Well, let's go into our random and also add a little bit of random scale. I'm gonna turn on scale. I'm gonna turn on uniform scale and I'm gonna set this to 0.5 and that way we get this random stuff. Okay, next we need to add some geometry to our splines. If we open up Redshift, uh, let's go ahead and do that now. I'm gonna use my startup layout my main layout has Redshift built in here. Also built one for Octane too when I'm using Octane. And if you haven't followed along with our uh, how to make a custom interface tutorial, we have one of those on YouTube. Uh, we're gonna try to link it up here in a card or down in the description. And uh, just search for how to make a custom Cinema 4D interface and you'll see how to set this up and lay it out. Okay, now if I uh, hit render here, I'm gonna hit play in my Redshift. You, we have the spheres but we don't have the lines. So let's create these splines and recreate them in the scene. Now there's different ways to do this as well. You could use a redshift tag and do that. I'm just gonna do it the good old fashioned way with a sweep. So the first thing I'm gonna need is an end side. And the next thing I'm gonna need is a sweep. So I'm gonna hit shift C and type in sweep. Hit enter. And the sweep is gonna sweep our end side, which is a kind of a round spline and we're gonna sweep that along this cloner right here. So if we put that in here, uh, all we have to do now is take this end side and make it much smaller. By default, the radius is 200 centimeters. And whenever you're working with small details like this, it's often that the defaults are just giant. Um, so you just need to knock this way down. I'm gonna set this to 0.4, and you can see the problem we have right away. We have this, um, uh, we have the spline here, but it's not cloning onto each of these splines the way that I want. So how do we do that? Well, in this case, it's connect object to the rescue. Connect object just solves so many problems like this. When you want something to behave uh, differently or as a single object instead of multiple objects, always try a connect object. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Shift C. I'm gonna type in connect. And this is the one, this one right here with the green arrow. And now I'm gonna drag my cloner in the connect object. I'm gonna drag my connect object under the sweep. And now we have a line for each of the uh, splines. So let's set this up, do a couple little things, and then we'll move on. First thing is I wanna add more segments to my end side so it's not as jagged. And I also wanna make this much smaller. I want this to feel like little beads on a real thin piece of string or something like that. Right now it's way too big. So let's go to the end side and set this to 0 0.07. Let's start there, lucky 0 0.07. That should be fine for now. And again, we could always adjust this later. Okay, so we have all this going. Uh, what do we have to do next? Well, let's start to set up some of the basic depth of field settings and then, we, uh, then we'll tweak it, add little stuff as we go. So let's first set up some basic materials so that we can add lights and cameras and really build in all of the reflections so that the depth of field works the way we want because it's not gonna look good with just all this gray in the screen here. So first thing we need to do is make a new material. Uh, I'm just gonna use just a basic black material. Go ahead to materials, or oh, I'm sorry, we do not have Redshift turned on. Let's go into render settings. Let's turn on Redshift. And after you do that, you should get the Redshift menu. And then when you go into the Create Materials, you'll see the Redshift tab right here. So go to your materials, go to Standard, and let's just take this basic material, drag it onto the sphere, and let's go in and just make this black. All right, so now we're gonna catch some nice reflections, and we have our basic black sphere. Well, we have no lights in our scene, and we need to have some nice little reflections and nice little pops of light. And that's gonna give us those nice little depth of field, bokeh balls and all the fun stuff that we're gonna get. So how do we set that up? Well, we need something for these objects to reflect. The easiest way to do this is to grab a light and go to dome light and in your dome light, select an HDRI. Now, if you have an HDRI that you love, go ahead and click this button here, go to your hard drive, select it and bring it in. 
If you're an HDRI Plus member, you have access to all of our HDRIs, and you could do this as well. You could just drag in an HDRI from the library, or if you are not sure which HDRI you're gonna use, you could drag this texture node right here, drag it into drop zone, and it'll automatically make an HDRI link tag and allow you to then just click anything here in the library and it'll automatically change right here in your scene. So for this one, I'm gonna start with Modern Industrial 2. I really love this window in the scene. And I want to rotate it, so go into your dome light and rotate around so it's just aiming off to the left there and you get these nice little reflections. I do not wanna see it in my scene, so go ahead and select the Object tab right here Scroll down and click on background and it will remove it from the background. However, I do want control over this black background. So I'm gonna grab a redshift dome light, another one. And this one I only want to use for the background. So I'm gonna go into my details and zero out all this stuff. So that now all it's doing is adding a background to my scene. I'm gonna go to my object and darken this down. I don't want it fully black, but I do want a little bit of color here. Okay, so we have some nice reflection. We have these strings. We have our, our spheres here. Now let's set up the basic depth of field look and really understand what is behind it. And for that, we need a camera. Camera is the ticket to all of this depth of field and bokeh and all this. So go to your Redshift tab, click on camera, and then click on standard camera. Now, if you've done photography in the past and you've used any macro lenses or done any close-up photography, you know that those types of lenses have a high focal length. They're often 80 or 100 or 150 or higher to really zoom in and get all of this detail. And that's really what this effect is all about. It's about zooming way in and setting your uh, depth of field uh, f-stop very low and getting all of this nice light bokeh and everything. So step one is cranking up your focal length. I've gone as high as 300 with this. Let's start with two. And now we have all of our spheres here, but we still have none of that depth of field. Well, go into your optical tab, come down here to your uh, aperture. Uh, actually, we're gonna mess with aperture in a second. Come down here to bokeh and click that button. And just like that, you get all of these nice little bokeh balls here. Now, they're, everything's blurry because this lens right now is out of focus in our whole scene. Remember, this is very teeny in Cinema 4D. We made this whole scene very small, and we made it small for a reason. Things that are small, when you zoom in on them and you use the correct aperture and the correct lenses in Cinema 4D, you naturally get realistic bokeh and all the fun stuff that we're doing. This is harder and harder to get the larger your scene is because that's just not how lenses in the real world works. If you take a photo of something large like a building, you rarely have these big uh, out of focus objects in the background, okay? So what do we do now? Well, how do we get some things in focus and some things in this bokeh world? Um, and that is to grab a focus null. So let's grab a null and I'm gonna call this focus just by double clicking on it. And in our Redshift camera, under optical, we're gonna drag this into the focus object. And now with our focus null selected, we can go make sure we grab our uh, model mode here, go over to our place tool, and then select any sphere here and just click and drag. And that specific sphere will be in focus and remain in focus throughout uh, any movement of your camera. Okay, so while we do have something in focus now, what happened to all of our beautiful out of focus? Well, you can see there's some things that are out of focus, but in the camera itself, if you come down to aperture, this is now our dial to turn up and down that blurry effect. And again, if you're f familiar with photography, uh, you know that a lower number means the aperture is larger and it lets in more light and gives more of that blurry effect. So a common number to start with is 1.5. There's a lot of lenses out there in the world that are 1.2 maybe, let's try 1.2. And now we're getting that effect, okay? Now we have out of focus objects that are behind our uh, focus plane. We have 
objects that are in front of the focus plane and they're starting to give us this lovely bokeh effect, okay? And you can control it. If you want it larger, you can go lower. You could even cheat it and go to something like 0.5. Or if you want it a little bit more subtle, you can crank it up to something like four, and you're essentially dialing in the amount of things that are in focus in your scene, okay? So what can we do from here? Well, another thing to keep in mind when you're working in this kind of macro, shallow depth of field look is that a lot of detail really helps sell this scene. Anytime you've put something under a microscope or really zoomed in on something like your th your fingerprint or anything like that, you know that there's all this hidden detail in here that you really can't see until you get close up. So the more little details we pack in here, the more of that depth of field and, and that feeling we will get, like we're really zoomed in on something. Now this isn't so bad so far, but what else can we do? Well. Let's add a little object in here and add a ton of little detail just so we have something else uh, to kind of look at the focus. So for that, uh, you can use any one of these primitives and scale it down. I'm gonna use some of our new doodads here. If you're a Grace Code Gorilla Plus member, you have access to all of this stuff here. And you can scroll down and pick any one of these. Uh, I like this little Tetra right here. And I'm just gonna move it up in our scene until it shows up kind of roughly where we are, there we go. Okay, so we basically have this little object now. I'm gonna scale it down a little bit and it's right in the middle of all of this madness. And if we put it in focus now, we're going to surround it with all of this nice little detail. I do wanna shrink down my sphere. I don't need it that big, so let's go to 0.5. And let's also add a little bit of material and uh, all, a bunch of clones on top of this thing to add even more detail. So first thing I'll do is grab, um, let's try the leather. I think this might have a ton of little detail we could use. I'm gonna use the leather black and I'm gonna drag it onto our object here. Let's just see how the light plays off of that. That's pretty good. I'm gonna focus now on that object. So grab my focus tool, grab my place tool, and uh, I'm gonna drag it right there on this top corner. And now when we get close up on this, this edge is in focus and everything else starts to become out of focus. And you're starting to see uh, the power of this now. We got very simple shapes, very simple objects, and we get all this nice little blurry detail here. Okay, so what else can we do on this object? Well, let's clone a ton of other objects on top of this to, to find little uh, details here. So let's quickly do this. Since we already did this once, let's grab a cloner. Let's grab a sphere. Let's make it super teeny. Let's go to 0.5 and let's clone that sphere. And in the cloner, let's go to object, go to grid and switch it to object mode. And then it'll ask you what object do you wanna clone onto? Let's clone onto this new doodad. Or if you pulled in any one of these primitives, just drag it in there. And now we need to tell the cloner that instead of 20 clones, we really wanna clone thousands of these spheres around. And before you crank this up, make sure you turn on multi-instance. This is gonna, again, allow you to add tons of clones without the render hit. So now I can crank this up. 5,000? Sure, why not? Okay, there may be a couple too many <laughs> spheres now on this object, but we could solve that. First of all, we could shrink this down just a little bit. Let's go to point three. Lovely. And then remember, we have the power of that um, push apart effector. So with this cloner selected, let's first uh, randomize the size of these clones. So I'm gonna turn up the segments on our sphere just so we have a little bit more round sphere. With your cloner selected, hit Shift C, hit random, and go to your position and turn that off. And instead, let's go to scale, turn on uniform scale, and Let's go 0.5. So now we have different size spheres, so that's a good start. Next thing we need to do is shrink some of them down based on how close they are. So again, we'll use that push effector, shift C, push, and right here, push apart, hit enter. Remember that by default, it just moves them apart. You want them to scale apart instead. And you want this radius to be way smaller, something like 0.5. Okay, there we go. Now we have 
all of these tons of little details here um, and adding a little bit of, of, of detail for this camera to, to bounce light off of. We could even add this same black reflective material to it just to add a little bit of detail. And because we're using the multi-instance, we could really crank this up, 10,000, why not? Once it's ready, it'll uh, populate the scene here, boom. And we have all this nice little detail all around our object. You can see all these little things out of focus right over here. And as we zoom out, you're gonna see it's catching all this nice little light here and here and here. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, let's, instead of having this one black sphere being cloned, let's go ahead and copy and paste this sphere. And instead, let's add a different material. For this one, let's grab something with a little bit of texture, but still kind of white or black. This concrete might work. Let's grab one of the concretes here. If you don't have plus, just make a new redshift material up here and you can adjust all the settings uh, just to make a uh, same color. It just won't have all this concrete detail on top of it. Okay, so now with this cloner, let's zoom back in, and now you can see we have different um, cloners doing different things based on uh, uh, the randomness here of our object. And you could also see as we zoom way in that this depth of field is so shallow, it's just this one line that we could see. And if you ever want, again, more focus in your scene, just go to your camera, and uh, now might be a good time to organize your scene. <laughs> it's starting to get a little messy. Uh, you just go to your camera, and you go to your optical tab, go down to aperture, and turn it up if you want things to be more in focus, and turn it down if you want it to be less in focus and you want more of this blurry effect. Okay, so now that we're setting up some of the basics here, we're starting to get in the composition of the scene. Now, the first thing I'll notice is that we have this nice reflection here from our HDRI, but the rest of this is very black um, and it all the detail goes away anywhere else but right up here. So let's add another light. This case, let's go to Redshift Lights, Area Light, and um, let's go ahead in the Area Light, click on this triangle right here and select Add Target, uh, target and Null. What this is gonna do is allow us to tell this area light where we want it to always focus towards. And in this case, we want it to be right on this object. So let's grab this light target. Let's grab our model mode, grab our place tool, and literally just click right on our uh, object here. And now we wanna grab this area light and move it over to maybe the side, maybe the bottom's not the worst place because we fill in all this nice detail. But, it is way too bright by default. So let's tone this down. And all we're trying to do is capture a little bit more detail here on the edges and the sides. And if I go to another view by clicking this button, clicking this button here, we're now looking at this from the top view. And I actually wanna look at this through a perspective view. So go to your view, uh, I'm sorry, go to your cameras, go to perspective. And now you essentially have a different view here that allows you to position this light uh, without messing with this render. If your camera moves, go ahead up here and just grab whatever your camera is named. My camera's named RS camera, so just select this if anything changes. Okay, so let's grab our area light and let's move it off to the side. And I just wanna add a little bit of fill light essentially to the front of this object. And this is looking okay and we may just need to brighten it up just a little bit. And now we're getting a little bit of detail here, and this thing is still the standout piece. Okay, so what else can we do here? Well, let's grab our camera, and let's play around a little bit with canting our camera. In this case, we can go to our coordinates and go to our rotation. Right here, you can see this is set to zero. And this will always be set to zero no matter where you move your camera because by default, your camera is gonna try to stay upright with the uh, top of the camera pointing up. And sometimes, especially if you're zooming in or you're you know, craning a camera around to really get a specific look, your camera might be a little bit crooked. And this is where you can control that. So you could just grab it and rotate it. You could see it here in the viewport, if we move around, that our camera is shifting left and right 
And there may be a key command for this as well. If you know the key command to do this for your camera, let me know. I always grab this right here and just rotate it. Now we get this nice angled camera. We get all this nice little depth of field from our ropes. In fact, our ropes are uh, a little too thick still. And this is the moment when I start tweaking all the little elements because all of these things come into play at different um, levels, depending on your lighting, depending on how close your camera is. And if anything's bugging you in your scene, it's a good time to go fix it. You don't have to only do lighting and only do models and then only do materials all at once. Um, if you're like me, you could jump around all the time. So in this case, I'm gonna grab our end side and set this even lower, 0.04. Let's make these strings really teeny tiny, like little ropes, perfect. So now this allows me to set up um, a composition for my scene. So what can we do? Well, if we're widescreen, we have some options. Let's drag, let's go back to our camera. And of course you could just set this up in the center and you know have all these lines kind of out and about. You could also zoom in and make this kind of the focus of your render and maybe a little bit less angle on your camera. And uh, that might maybe angle it this way more. And now you have this kind of close up of all this detail and all these other spheres are around. Um, let's see what else we could do. There's also, if you're working in square, let's go to 1280. And in this case, let's try a couple looks. Number one is centered. Let's get those angles going again. And I also wanna look down instead of from the side of those strings. If you're looking down on the strings, then these parts of these strings will come into focus and then out of focus. And this is a really cool look here. And this angle, actually, I really am starting to like. Um, what I might do is just angle this object down a little bit. Just gonna grab this rotation here. And there's a lot cloning onto it, so you may wanna turn your clones off before you rotate it. But that that's looking better. I'm gonna split the difference. I'm gonna undo that and go back a little bit, because I do like that bright edge. I'm just gonna move it just a little bit. There it goes, okay, now we're talking. Okay, so that's kind of a nice setup. We have a little bit of detail here. It's still very bright there. I might even add a little bit more brightness to this dome light. Let's go into our object and crank up the exposure on our dome light. That's gonna add a little bit there. And this is starting to look good. Okay, so if, you, if you're if you coming to this tutorial to understand the basics of the camera and how to set all this up, uh, you know, we basically um, have done all of the parts with the camera that we could except for one thing I wanted to show you. And for that, let's go into our Redshift camera, let's go to optical, and let's scroll down to this bokeh. Remember early on, this button did it all. Here's without all the nice effects, and here's with all the effects. Now these little spheres here, the bokeh, these are the out of focus elements, and we can control these inside of Redshift to give them more realism and to really add a lot more beautiful detail to this render. Now by default, this looks pretty good. We got these nice circles. But if we open up this bokeh tab here by clicking this triangle, you can see we have a bunch more settings. We have the aspect ratio of the bokeh, we could turn up and down. If I turn this to something like 0.5, we now get these nice tall, uh, like anamorphic lenses. You may have to go a little bit less than that, maybe 0.7, you start to get these ovals. And then of course, if you go the other way, they're gonna stretch out to the side. But there's even more control we have. If we keep scrolling down here and we look at this tab right here, there says image. If you click on image, it now allows you to drag in a bokeh image to add more realistic shapes to this bokeh. And if you're a Plus member, we have a whole tab dedicated to this you may have not used in the past. And if you haven't used it, it's called bokeh, it's right here. And we have realistic lenses inside of this tab that allow you to just drag it in all the way from very simple shapes to these Fresnel shapes that you may have seen. Let's start with one of these Fresnel shapes, just so I could show you a real drastic example. Right now, these spheres are just purely white circles. If I drag this in, the, uh, one of these Fresnel shapes, you now are gonna see that it has a hollow inside. And different lenses 
react to light in different ways. And that's what these bokeh uh, objects represent. And this allows you now to dial in not just what your camera looks like, but even the out of focus areas and how it affects it. You could even grab some of these that have this chromatic aberration and have the uh, different colors separated. And again, this is common in a lot of lenses, and especially uh, cheap lenses will have separation depending on the brightness uh, or depending on the hue of, of, of the color. And you now have control over this. Now, my favorites are these simulated ones. These are based on real lenses and real detail that hits the, the lens and eventually hits your sensor. So if you grab something like one of these simulated and, and, and you... Uh, use one of these that has a little bit of chromatic aberration. You get a little bit of color uh, detail and you get a much more realistic bokeh. So uh, I highly recommend you play around with these, especially if you're cranking this number low, you start to get these beautiful out of focus areas and you can play around with the quality of that out of focus area as you play with this. Now, as we get to our final render, Let's go ahead and add a little bit of a LUT. I'm gonna to go to our gear here. And in the LUT, I'm gonna grab, I'm just gonna, first of all, turn on our LUTs. And I'm gonna go in and pick this Advantix 200. Uh, I've been using this a ton. You could experiment with all of these. We even have LUTs in Grayscale Gorilla Plus you could download. Um, but I'm gonna use this and use it just a little bit. A little bit goes a long way here, especially since everything is so dark to begin with. Okay, let's close all this up. Let's turn that off. And let's find a beautiful frame to render now. Now I'm just positioning my scene. I really love all the detail here on the upper side of this object. I may even add a little bit more um, uh, detail to these spheres just by going up to the cloner, going to object. And again, we could just double this number just by selecting it. And let's go uh, to 20,000. You can see, you can crank this up really high, especially if you're using multi-instance. You may wanna turn down uh, the resolution of your spheres. I may have went a little crazy on those. So you can see all the little details there, but let's go ahead and grab our two spheres and we, for them being that small, we definitely de don't need all of this geometry. So let's go ahead and just crank this down just a little bit. And let's go to our push part effector and scale this down so that some of these larger spheres can still stay on the object without them all being shrunken down to little microscopic little bits. You can see at 20,000 clones, we're starting to push uh, the capabilities here of the cloner, but that is totally okay. Um, it's not that long. And in fact, we're already done here. And so let's go ahead and find a final frame that we're happy with. And then let's quickly talk about render settings because you do need to crank some of your render settings for this type of look. Okay, so this is pretty good. Um, I do like how much of that is in focus. I'm gonna move my focus back a little bit, maybe just back here, just so it's not right on the corner. Maybe right back here. There we go. And you can see that it is a little bit grainy wherever things are out of focus. And unfortunately, this is just brute force. You have to just give um, the renderer a ton of time to calculate this. Now, it's not super crazy, like sometimes when you're working with glass and everything like that, but I do wanna warn you that you may have to crank things up, maybe even just to this high setting to really clear up some of the grain here. Uh, if you wanna test it, all you have to do is turn on your a uh, little wireframe mode here. It gives you a little bit of a segment to render. And you also wanna turn on your bucket mode and it will essentially do a mini version of the render right here in your viewport or right here in your IPR. Okay, and with these settings, you see that was pretty fast, but we still have some grain. So let's go into our render settings and let's just click this to high for now. And you can see it's gonna take a little bit longer to calculate, but it's already much cleaner. And if you're doing animation, this may be fine. And if you're doing a large still, you may wanna crank it up even more, especially if you're just doing it, this for stills. Let's see if this cleans up this area over here. Oh yeah, look at all that. Look at all that nice little detail here. We got our nice little bokeh, weird chromatic aberration happening. And I'm still seeing a little bit of grain, but I think we'll be okay for this. Let's go back to our regular mode. 
And let me show you one more little trick while I'm remembering. Inside of your render settings, under Redshift, click on Advanced and go into your System tab. Now, bucket rendering right here, um, I have found that for my setup, I have uh, two 3090s and I find that for graphics cards that have uh, more RAM and have more space, that bigger bucket sizes speed up the rendering quite a lot. Sometimes 512 is too much, so I just always default to this 256, and I'm gonna do more testing and try to learn a little bit more about what's going on. And if you guys know any uh, details too, put them in the comments, but I found that this 256 setting uh, really helps speed it up. I get like 20% faster renders. Okay, so with high uh, setup, um, I like our composition, we're ready to go. I'm gonna hit Shift R and we're gonna render this puppy. All right, and we're all set, we're all done rendering. That took about one minute and the cleaned up really well. So again, depending on what you're trying to do, you may wanna turn that stuff up and down. And this is a really powerful technique. So if you made it this far, I highly encourage you to experiment. Remember to keep these fundamentals in mind. Small objects work better than large objects. Lower aperture works better than high aperture. And really picking a zoomed in lens and getting really close in and adding a ton of detail to your scene really accentuates this type of really shallow depth of field look. All right, here's one more tip to take this effect even further. And what we're gonna do is add luminate materials to some of these spheres to really accentuate these big bokeh balls we're making here. So let's get started. Uh, all we need, really need to do is take these spheres on the lines and make multiple different versions of them. Right now we just have uh, these black spheres and uh, I'm just gonna hit uh, Command C, Command V to copy and paste this sphere. And on this second one, we're gonna make a new material. Let's go head on up to Create, Redshift, Materials, Standard. And I'm gonna drag this one on top of this new sphere and we're gonna go in, we don't have to open up the nodes, we just select the material, scroll down, go to a mission, and this is where the magic happens. Crank this puppy up. 20, we got some bright spheres here. Now that's too big and too bright, so let's, first of all, make these much smaller, so we could do something like 0.1, and now they're gonna capture the, there we go. Now they're capturing the light and adding the, these really bright areas, and we can also, change the color on this. Um, and this is gonna help get that really like twinkle light bulb look. So we can go in here and just crank some really saturated colors to add a different mood to this scene. So I love this really, really saturated red. Let's also duplicate the sphere one more time. And it also duplicated our material, which is nice because we're gonna make this second one uh, a different color. So open up this new material. Scroll down and let's change this from red to, I don't know, greeny blue or something like that, a little bit opposite. And now we're getting a little bit of both. There we go. Um, this kind of teal color look, looks pretty good. We could also mess around with maybe some gold and yellow kind of vibes. Yeah, we can mess around with the colors all day, but this is the, I like this teal better. Uh, this is the effect I wanted to show you before we leave because this could be very powerful um, in really accentuating this look. And if you're trying to go for that Christmas bulb kind of feel, really make these bright areas, this is a good way to do it. And remember, if you want more or less of these lit up, you can add more in the cloner. So just turn up this number to add more spheres to your clones. Um, or you can uh, change the ratio between the different spheres. So right now we have a, a kind of a one, three to one ratio, right? We have th two bright ones and one black one. So there'll be more bright ones in our scene. And if we just wanna change that and make it more even, we can add another black sphere. And this'll just reduce the number of these really bright areas. So you still have control, even if it's random in your sphere cloner. All right, that's it. I just wanted to share one more quick tip to push this look to the next level. And hopefully this helps in your next render. If you have any questions or anything didn't work in this tutorial, please let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. And I always appreciate when you leave a comment.
Thanks again for watching everybody. And don't forget, we have a ton of other videos here on YouTube all about how to use Redshift. So consider subscribing if you're new to our YouTube channel. And with that, I hope to see you in another tutorial really soon. Bye everyone.